All right, my name is Adrian Crenshaw. Talk you here to see is dropping docs on docnets, uh, how people got caught. So we're going to talk about some uh, famous case history on various people who have been using Tor or some other anonymizing um, systems and have gotten busted still. By the way, in all these cases, none of it was a flaw in Tor directly. It was all bad OPSEC. Um, well, I'll cover what they screwed up. Um, basically, we'll talk about how people got de-anonymized. And uh, the first case I want to talk about is the Harvard bomb threat. Did you all hear about this last year? Yes. Yeah, guy at Harvard apparently um, mailed and said, hey, we got some bombs. Here's the exact thing he said. Shrapnel bombs placed in Science Center, Silver Hall, Emerson Hall, Thayer Hall, two or four, guess correctly, be quick, or they will go off soon, before they go off soon. So he sent this on December 16th. Well, they had to figure out who this guy was. Apparently what he used was Gorilla Mail, and up in the headers, well, the email address it would be from Gorilla Mail, so they could tell that, and apparently he sent it over Tor. Now, I sent my own message using Gorilla Mail, and one of the things Gorilla Mail does is it uses your originating IP address. By the way, that's not mine, I've modified it some, but it use, puts in your originating IP address. So let's say if you did it from home, your real IP address would be in that mail, and they could look in the headers and find it. Now this guy did use Tor, so it didn't have that in there. It had an IP address of a Tor server there. So that was a step in the right direction as far as anonymity is concerned. However, all Tor nodes are public, and it's easy to figure out, oh, is this machine Tor or not? You can just look it up. There's a reverse DNS of sorts that you can use to figure out if it's a Tor node. A lot of times these Tor nodes even have Tor in the name of them. Um, it's, so it's easy to correlate who was attacking um, well, basically what they did was they looked to see who was using Tor during the time that the email was sent. And um, they found this one particular individual. Now, this guy had been using a bridge, as I mentioned before, that wouldn't have been advertised in Tor's directories. He probably would have got away with it. Or if he just walked to the local coffee shop and used Tor, he probably would have got away with it. However, he did it from the university network. So they found this guy named Eldo Kim, and apparently, he was one of the few people on Tor at the time. Now, I'd hope at Harvard, I don't know what kind of um, research Harvard does into an anonymity. I give a lot of talks on anonymity for someone who can hardly say it. But uh, <laughs> uh, he, um, he may not have been the only person on Tor, but when they found out he was one of them and they went and talked to him, you know, he admitted to everything, and uh, apparently he put in the bomb threat, my understanding, because he wanted to get out of a, like a final or a mid, or it would be a final at that time of year. So he sent that in and it's in huge trouble just to get out of a final. Oh well. More details. All is technical, by the way, has some great write-ups on all these cases. Check those out. Also, there's some uh, court documents out at Scrib D. These slides, by the way, are very close to this exact version, should be on your DEF CON CD. Also, I have them on the online. So this guy was hard for he did, he did it out of his own, on his own network. Yeah, he did it from, well, from the Harvard oh. network. Yeah, from Probably from, I think maybe from his dorm room. I don't remember the exact location. Yeah. <laughs> so lesson learned from this, uh, don't be the only person using Tor in a modern network at any given time. <laughs> use a bridge. If you'd used the bridge, mm, probably wouldn't have been caught. Uh, don't do it in the first place. That's another thing. Yes. Don't admit anything. That would have gone a long way. And um, correlation attacks are a bitch. And we'll talk a little bit about what a correlation attack is here in a second. Essentially, where a correlation attack is, you watch the traffic and see what's going on. For instance, let's say everything is encrypted, but if you see a five meg request, which would be a big request, but still, and then go out and you watch both this node and this node, by the way, you can tell these two are evil, right? Because it's got the little goatee. <laughs> I showed me kind of met a guy named Ralph. He looks like my evil computer, I swear to you. It's, it's, it's. But anyway, these guys are sniffing it. So this one and this one, in what's known as a civil attack, Someone controls both those nodes. Well, he can sit there and sniff and say, oh, I saw five megs come in this way, five megs come out this way, I saw an eight meg response come back. Wait a second, that's not what I meant to do. Yep, see the five megs go out that way, eight megs come back this way, and he can see them both. Now, granted, remember those three levels of encryption there? So the, the messages don't look the same because they have extra crypto keys in the middle, like this guy's. The guy, I'm pointing here, why am I doing that? It's not a touch screen, Adrian. <laughs> Yeah, right, this guy right here. So, I mean, the, the traffic doesn't look the same. It's encrypted with different keys, but since it's the exact same size and the timing of it, they have a good idea that, oh, this might be who it is. Now, in this case, the correlation attack was who was using Tor at that particular time. Um, timing correlation might be similar. Uh, pain in my buttocks.
All right, let's see if this thing will crash again or not. Ah. I got my stuff together here eventually. All right, shift F5, F in because it's a freaking Macintosh. Okay, so um, that was the attack I was mentioning before, just looking at traffic. There's also timing attacks that could possibly be done based on when the traffic is coming through. And there's been some work on uh, people trying to DDoS part of the network to uh, say, okay, I know it's coming through here. If I DOS that and I can put, tr uh, it, well, if I can force a certain pattern to the traffic, you might be able to recognize that down the chain. Now, the attack that they were doing with the, um, oh, relay early, if I understood what they were doing, they were doing some kind of tagging attack that they didn't expect to be, uh, people to be able to do. Uh, but basically, you want to do something to the traffic to make it visible down the line to know who was talking to who. That could be like uh, dosing certain boxes. Like if I know certain boxes are out there on the internet or Tor, I could try dosing this one. Do I think that's the server? All right, did the server go down? All right, maybe that wasn't it. Try the next one and so forth. Or just, you know, dosing something along the path and trying to induce a pattern in the traffic. Um, if you're one of the nodes along the way, I guess you could post the traffic yourself. Uh, or even just change the load on a path. There was something called a Maginal, not Maginal, that's a, the, a French firewall company. Um, see, no, it's a, history buffs. Uh, no, um, uh, Thor. Thor from Kamo Comics. What the, what's the name of his hammer? Ma Molinier. They had this project called Molinier, I believe it was the NSA, and it's, from what I read of the documents, it sounded a little bit like this, causing extra traffic along the way so you can kind of modify and put like a pattern to the data. I, I could be misreading it. If someone from the NSA wants to talk to me about it, I'd love to hear. <laughs> also, I really want an NSA challenge coin and a little hat, please. Just, just saying. All right. Another thing, this is not a correlation attack, but I remember I mentioned how sometimes you can really screw it up and you set up your browser yourself. By default, let's say you set up Tor in Firefox yourself, not using the Tor browser bundle. There was a setting that says use DNS over the SOX proxy. That is by default off. If it's off, what happens is when you query polyesterroad.onion, it will first do the DNS query to your own ISP's DNS servers. So they don't, won't see the traffic, but they will see that you were trying to go to that particular site. That's why if you're going to set up yourself, you got to go in and it's only for about config, it's something like uh, proxy relay to uh, DNS. But uh, Tor Browser Bundle by default does that. So that's no reason to use Tor Browser Bundle. So while they don't see the data, they can see who you're trying to visit based on the DNS queries. Okay. Next case, lulsec. You remember these guys from a couple years ago, right? All right, Hector Xavier Monsignig? How do you pronounce that? Well, I'm going to call him Sabu because Sabu is easy for me to remember. Now, normally he was using Tor to connect to the IRC network, and um, so they wouldn't necessarily know his home IP. But one time he got lazy and he didn't connect. So he got himself caught and started to collaborate because he really didn't want to go to jail. Matter of fact, last I heard, he think he got off completely now. I think, he's mo I think he's pretty much um, home free at this point. But um, anyway, he didn't use Tor consistently. Eventually, they found him. And uh, I don't understand. Some of these people who do these illegal acts, why don't you use something like I2P, which has IRC built into it? And you can do it all over anonymous network. Because even if you use um, a cloaking, I can't remember what, what the terminology is on IRC, a cloak that hides your IP address from other people doing like a right click and who is this, it's still is a problem because the person who owns the IOSC servers might look at your IP address and figure out who you are. There was actually uh, Ryan Cleary, I think he's a great, he lives in Great Britain. He was part of, um, part of the anonymous movement at one time and he got pissed off at other people at it, and he was running one of the IOSC servers so he just started dumping everybody's IP addresses and who he thought they were on the internet as I recall. So if they'd all been using IGP and IRC they probably wouldn't have got caught. All right. Anyway, Hector, there was no guy in the set he was speaking with called SUPG. Ends up it's Jeremy Hammond, though, um, at least that's who's suspected, though they didn't know that at the time. And um, Jeremy let slip various bits of information, like where he had been arrested or detained before, and various uh, political groups he was involved with. And they got a general idea for where in the world he lived. Now, this narrowed the suspect pool down a whole lot, and they finally got enough evidence to be able to get, well, the ability to monitor his internet access. 
Because it was various things like, you know, I was arrested at this particular location, I'm involved with these particular people, from some of the things he said made it very clear that he lived in the Midwest, and there's only so many people that fit those kind of qualities and have already have a record, so they were able to, you know, narrow it down. Now, Hammond did use Tor consistently, as far as I can tell from what records I've read, and the crypto was never busted, but they were able to use essentially timing correlation attacks, well, calling it attack seems overblown, but timing correlation to figure out that sub G was always online at the same time uh, Hammond was and talking, and that when sub G was talking to Cebu, Hammond was in his residence using his internet connection. And while he was using Tor at all times, as far as I can tell, they were able to figure out, well, it seems likely that it is indeed him. A lot more details on the Oz Technical article, but um, let's take, get a few lessons from this one. Lessons learned. First, use Tor consistently. If someone uses it only you know, part of the time, that's going to cause a problem. Now, back in the day when you had to figure, configure Tor yourself, uh, one attack that was really cool to do is uh, to give someone a cookie while they're in Tor, wait for them to disconnect from Tor. If they come back and visit your site again without Tor, you see that cookie and you know who that was. And I, I actually have a feature on my website that, that does that. Now, if you're using um, Tor Browser Bundle, that doesn't work because it's going to clear out that history every time you, you know, shut it down. But um, yeah, use Tor consistently. Don't give out a lot of personal information. If the guy hadn't released a whole bunch of stuff about, you know, this is where I was arrested, these are the people I was hanging out with, this is what I'm involved in, it, they probably wouldn't be able to narrow it down to him. Also, correlation tax is still a bitch. Because of when he was online versus when uh, Sub G was talking to Sabu, they figured out who he was. Case number two, and by the way, in case you can't figure it out, I'm following the programmer's um, standard of counting from zero. So case number two, Freedom Hosting. Now, Freedom Hosting is a company that basically allowed people to uh, get hosting services inside of Tor, so they didn't have to set up their own boxes for a hidden service, they basically used these people's. But they hosted a lot of different things, and amongst them, uh, some child porn related services. That wasn't the only thing they were about, but that was one of the things they had. They had. They also had some legitimate stuff as well, like um, Tor Mail, I believe, was one of the things that that particular group ran. Well, Freedom Hosting had already come underneath attack before because of the whole hosting of child porn. Anonymous had an op a while back called Op Darknet, op, op Darknet where they were um, attacking them and uh, trying to hack the websites. And I think at one point they dumped a bunch of information about who was using them. Um, just because it's anonymous, doesn't mean that the web application on the other end isn't vulnerable. And that's why I'm saying how they dumped a bunch of um, uh, accounts from them. What was that? Oh. Um, all right, on July 13th, though, FBI finally compromised one of Freedom Hosting's boxes and decided to insert some malicious JavaScript. There was this bug out. That's the CVE number if you really want to see it. And it existed in Firefox uh, version 17 extended service release. And a recent version of the Tor browser bundle happened to be using that particular uh, version of Firefox, so it was vulnerable. Now, Tor had already um, updated the package. If all these people had updated by that time, they wouldn't have got caught because they wouldn't have been vulnerable to this. But a lot of people don't necessarily update in a timely fashion. So they had this vulnerability, and they had control of uh, at least one uh, freedom hosting service. So they installed this malware using this JavaScript bug and were able to um, do some stuff. Basically, they installed a piece of malware called Magneto. And they dropped Magneto on there, and it would phone home to some servers in Virginia, things like uh, the host's public IP address. Uh, some of the content, let me see. MAC address was reported. That kind of narrows it down to the machine. You can do some finagling there. The Windows host name, and a unique serial number to tie the user to the site visit. Uh, this sounds kind of similar to the project, I think I've read in some of the Snowden documents about something called the Egotistical Giraffe Project, which is a beautiful name. Uh, I don't think it's exactly the same exploit, though. I mean, maybe the same, sorry, the same exploit, but not entirely the same project, because I'm not sure the FBI and the NSA collaborated that much. But there was a similar thing out there called Egotistical Giraffe. And there was a lot of cases in the past of um, uh, law enforcement doing something similar like getting malware installed on someone's machine so they can track them and see what they're up to. Uh, other examples would be Magic Lantern. Fox Acid is another um, project of, I believe it was the NSAs, and it, oh, what is it? GHB, GB8, what is Great Britain's equivalent of the NSA? 
GCHQ. I, I believe that might have been a, a side project for both of them. I may get this wrong, so you know, I'm just pointing it out, and if I get it wrong, let me know after the talk. And a CPAB would be another example. Um, oh, big thanks to Joe Cicero. He gave a talk at uh, ThoughtCon this year that was really good. Unfortunately, it was not recorded. So if he ever gives us a talk on privacy and a surveillance state again, go check that out. He might even be here at DEF CON. I think that was the first time I ever met him was at DEF CON 2009. Anyway, freedom hosting. Eventually, they compromised the box. They were able to place malware on all sorts of people's machines. And so eventually, they figured out they thought they knew who was hosting or who was the head guy in charge of freedom hosting. And it ended up being this Eric Inouye Marquez. And he's alleged to be the operator of freedom hosting. Also, they traced him down because of how he did payments. See, he has to buy the service someplace, and they may be running Tor to directly communicate with him, but once they compromise a box and figure out, oh, this is the real IP address, that's who, who's actually leasing this box, that ties it to him pretty quick. Um, now, when they busted him, he's said to have dived for his laptop to shut it down. That goes back to the whole cold boot attack thing I was talking about. If, you, if the machine was shut down, if it has full hard drive encryption, modern crypto, I mean, you don't beat it mathematically. You beat it through uh, bad implementation or rubber hose cryptography. Look that one up, it's lovely. Um, in his case, he knew about this and he was like trying to die for his laptop allegedly so he can close it down so that they couldn't get the data, but apparently he didn't get to it fast enough. A lot more details and a wild article on it. Lessons learned from this one. Don't host Captain Picard or Julian Bashir. that's one thing. You're all not familiar with 4chan culture, are you? Okay, let me explain. Um, Julian Bashir is uh, short for, well, JB and jailbait. Uh, Captain Picard, CP, child porn. That's where the names came from. I actually gave a talk a few years back at I think it was an Ohio Information Security Forum. Maybe that was it. Uh, it was some uh, ISSA event, and I gave a talk on Anonymous and tried to explain how Anonymous isn't one cohesive group. It's kind of a banner term. It's a meme more than anything for people who want to go and do a particular thing. And I used a bunch of in-culture terminology, which can get pretty offensive. I mean, the whole, whole purpose of people's, um, Anonymous' uh, point in life is to, you know, do it for the lulls and troll people in a lot of cases. So I was using in-term, in-culture terminology, and I think the quote my buddy said about me not getting invited back was, well, Mr. Crenshaw's talk was real research, it was wholly inappropriate. <laughs> if you get to know the anonymous guys in 4chan, you, you'll get, yeah, okay, maybe it was somewhat true. Um, next thing you can learn, patch, patch, patch. If these people had kept up with the patches, they would have been just fine and dandy because Tor browser bundle had already been patched by then. Although I don't think they put the warning at the time. Now if you have an outdated version of the Tor browser bundle that's not too outdated, you'll see a little warning message up near the onion that says, hey, there's a newer version out, you should really update. I don't think they were doing that at that time. Is there anybody with the Tor project here? Okay, I guess they can't answer that question then. <laughs> I don't think they were doing that at the time. Um, also, follow the money. Like I said, my understanding is they tied the server to him via how he paid for him. And leave encrypted laptops in a powered down state when not in use. That would have helped out a whole lot. All right. Making a hidden server contact you over the public internet. I'm not sure exactly what Freedom Hosting's problems was, but let's say they had some kind of web vulnerability. Uh, let's say they had an in uh, command injection. If you can connect to it, send your exploit to it, even if it's all encrypted and getting there, you can make it contact you outside of the Tor network, depending on what firewall rules are in place and so forth. This would be a little bit harder on something like Tails because they have certain rules in place to keep you from doing that. But if it's just like my old Linux box I set up, use Tor for, and I happen to have a, a command injection vulnerability, they could do something like ping themselves or do a trace route back and see what the results are and have a good idea of who the host actually is, the real world IP address. That brings us to case three, the Silk Road. Who else heard of these, folk, these guys? Okay, Silk Road. Silk Road was something that um, ran by a guy named Dread Pirate Roberts. And um, it allowed buyers and sellers to exchange, well, let's say, less than legal goods. There's all sorts of things that they could sell on there. Uh, here's some stuff in the court documents. I mean, cannabis, uh, dissociatives, uh, uh, ecstasy, intoxicants, opiates, precursors, uh, prescriptions of psychedelics, stimulants, all sorts of really fun, fun stuff. Oh, great. What is the guy who would say winning to that? Oh, great. Charlie Sheen, yes. This is Charlie Sheen's dream here. Uh, 
so, but they also had other things, like various services, like you could hire someone to attack a system for you, you could uh, find counterfeit bills, but then also I saw other policies that said you couldn't have counterfeit currencies. I, I, I'm a little confused about some of that. Also, while they didn't seem to have a problem with like stolen credit card numbers and so forth, they had a problem with forged diplomas. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure what the deal is with that, but anyway, they were making some big bucks. Uh, with about 1.2 million billion, uh, yeah, the uh, FBI got a little interest in these guys. So they started looking around for the earliest references to Silk Road on the public internet. You can use Google operators to say, all right, give me everything from this time period to this time period, this time period to this time period. Just keep throwing that back until you can find the earliest reference to the Silk Road. And well, they found it on the Shroomery. It's a little uh, druggy website, um, and this guy had posted on it a guy by, going by the handle of Altoid on 1-27-2011. And here's, um, well, I don't think I should have up what he said, but essentially he was advertising the Silk Road. And it's very really clear from his text that he was advertising it and uh, not just asking a question, because he has these very well, flavorful words. I came across this website called Silk Road. It's a hidden, it's a, a tall hidden service that claims to allow you to buy and sell anything online anonymously. I'm thinking of buying off of it but wanted to see if anyone here had heard of it or could recommend it. And he gives information on how to uh, visit it. And from the, it's very clear from the way he wrote it, it sounds more like an advertisement than someone just asking a question about it. But that was the very first uh, re reference they could find to Silk Road on the internet. Then on Bitcoin Talk, he, there was someone posting and asking about it as well and um, pointing out that this thing, the Silk Road exists and seeing if anybody's actually used it. Then, also on Bitcoin Talk, later on, um, let's see, he's basically describing it again, and it's the same username, different form, same username, Altoid. And you want to know what people thought about it. But once again, it sounds very much like an advertisement. Then, later on, Altoid, again on Bitcoin Talk, started looking for an IT pro in the Bitcoin community. And here's where it got dumb. He said, contact me at RossUlbrick at gmail.com. <laughs> that is some obsec fail from hell right there. <laughs> so, yeah, that tied the first mention of Silk Road ever they could find on the internet to a handle named Altoid, and Altoid to an email address belonged to uh, Ross. So, yeah, that was pretty bad. Also, a few other things to point out. Uh, Dred Powell Roberts posted a, lot of, uh, posted a lot about his economic philosophy on the Silk Road, and Ulbrick and Ross both had an interest in uh, the Mises Institute and what's known as Aust Austri Austrian School of Economics. So they had similar interests, kind of like um, Jeremy Hammond let loose too much of his personal life. Uh, well, Ross did the same thing. And um, as I said, he just mentioned the uh, same things that Ross mentioned, so that kind of narrowed it down to him possibly, though that's not necessarily a firm, firm thing. But you get enough little pieces of evidence together, apparently you can get a court order. Um, also, another thing he did that was kind of screwy, Ross Ulbrich account was posted on Stack Overflow and he was asking for help with some PHP code for connecting to a Tor hidden service. And he quickly changed his username to Frosty, but the first username he used was Ross Ulbrich. <laughs> I don't know why. But that's what he did. So guess who is the main suspect at this point for Dread Pirate Roberts? Ross William Ulbrich. And that's about the expression I would have on my face too if I was the main suspect for that. <laughs> what is it, 1.2 billion and the FBI takes interest. All right. Someone was connecting to a server that hosts the Silk Road from an internet cafe that was nearby Ross. They would start looking into it. And I think they also found that he had been logging into Gmail from the exact same place, mostly in the Pacific time zone. This becomes like death by a thousand paper cuts eventually. Uh, yeah, the IP of the Silk Road server was attached to via a VPN server that was connected to from an IP belonging to an internet cafe on Laguna Street in San Francisco from which Ulbrich had connected to his Gmail account before. Um, this more and more ties. Uh, there was a PM to Dread Roberts from a user that said the site was leaking some sort of external IP address. Um, this is kind of fairly common on some web applications. If you type in the right things and they don't do proper sanitization, you can figure out what the internal IP address is. The IP address in this case belonged to the VPN. Um, yeah, eventually though, the FBI was able to find some of the servers and start uh, getting hard drive images of them. 
How they initially found them completely, I'm not sure. I don't know if they used the previous bug, if they exploited the box. There's a lot of conjecture. Nicholas Weaver conjectures that uh, they exploited the box and got in. However, there's also a story I read about someone contacting, um, making sure I have time, someone contacting Ross about wanting to sell a whole bunch of cocaine, I believe it was, and Ross put him in contact with one of his like form admins or one of his employees, and that employee was going to buy it, but he bought it through his own house, and then the FBI was able to land on him at his own house. Now they have someone who works for the Silk Road who probably had access to server infrastructure, so they may not have had to hack anything. They may have just followed where the drugs went, said, oh, you work for the Silk Road? You work for us now. Let us into the boxes. And they got hard drive images and um, were able to start monitoring more. Another big problem, uh, let me see if I have it on here. No, it's a later slide, I think. Um, no problem that he ended up having was um, he had ordered a bunch of fake IDs. And these got intercepted coming across the border, like nine IDs of different names. But they all had Ulbricht's picture on them. Homeland Security found these and they went to go talk to him. And he denied having ordered them. I mean, I've seen a lot of documentaries on um, people escaping prosecution 10 minutes and generally denying everything is a good call. The next thing he did I don't understand though. Um, the denying thing, that's all good. But however, he apparently is alleged to have said, Opec volunteered that hypothetically anyone could go onto a website named Silk Road on tour and purchase any drugs or fake identity documents the person wanted. Why the hell would you admit that? Why would you say that? But yeah, that's that started pulling them back to him. And oh, by the way, his roommates, when the people showed up, the, in, uh, the uh, Homeland Security folks, uh, knew him as Josh and not his real name. So, also fake IDs with someone else, with your face on them. What reason would other people have to buy those? It's framing you in some way, I suppose. But it seems like it's better ways to do that. Also, one of those servers that they end up getting control over had Frosty at Frosty in one of the keys, um, and he'd used Frosty's before as a handle. And uh, eventually, they took down the site and they landed on him in a library as he, right after he entered his password on his laptop, for same reasons as uh, I suppose the previous gentleman. Uh, more info on these particular articles. Nate Anderson did a great write-up. I believe that was for Ars Technica. And Agent Christopher Tarbell did a lot of the, did some of the best court document stuff I've read. Uh, lessons learned: keep online identities separate. If he'd kept his interest to himself, that probably would have helped. Also, if he hadn't used Tor from the same locations he was logging into his uh, Gmail, that would help some. Also, uh, you know, not using the same handles multiple places would help. Uh, having a consistent story would help, like his roommates knowing him as Josh. Uh, don't talk about interests. Don't volunteer information like I have no idea why he said, theoretically you could buy this on Silk Road. <laughs> demos, I have a little bit of time for some demos. So let me illustrate some of the things I was mentioning about uh, possible ways of de-anonymizing people. Um, there's a couple things you can do. Not everything that a person is necessarily going to open is going to respect the proxy settings on the local machine. So let's say, you're accessing something over Tor and I try to convince you, hey, go to this one particular website and download this Word doc. It's all safe and good. Go ahead and do that. Well, depending on how your browser is set up, it may not respect um, the proxy settings. Now, I'm trying to connect to Tor right here and hopefully this comes up within a reasonable amount of time. I should have had that up earlier already. Okay. That's up. Let me say I visited this particular site, tracking doc, and this is a little word doc. I've embedded an image in it. Since then, John Strand has shown me a better way of doing this, but I'm still using the image format for right now. So I'm doing it all over Tor browser. I got the word doc it, document. I'm going to open it. And um, yeah, it's a trap. Yes, it's a trap. <laughs> and hi there, image. Uh, yes, I need to register. I know. I'm sorry, Microsoft. Tor, hi there. And now if I went to a certain page I have set up for um, tracking, let me see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, sniff that password real quick. Uh, not much you can do it right here. You notice I now have the IP address, the real IP address of whoever was accessing it. I think. I hope that's one of those uh, IP addresses. Anyway. That's hopefully what I got right there and I can do a correlation tag of when it was downloaded from the servers over Tor versus uh, when I see this. Uh, another option, by the way, if you want something more professional than my little um, ghetto doc file, there's something called honey scripts. Oh, sorry, sorry, um, 
I'll get to it in a second. Uh, honey docks. Uh, my friend uh, Marcus J. Carey runs it. And uh, I've made a bunch of um, fake documents for it. I'm calling this one creditcards.zip. And hopefully if it downloads, if you open up any of those, it gives you options like Excel files, Word docs, and so forth. And it's being really slow to download right now. So I'm just going to switch over to the screen where it is. And right here, I could go in there and see who opened the iDocs via the real IP address. Except for it's probably logged me out by now. You all can watch this for a second. Everybody close your eyes. Let's see. Not that long a password. You all can guess it. Eh, remember it. I feel bold. <laughs> Do your thing. Okay. And there's my DEF CON demo and there's various people who've accessed it. I asked people to access over Tor. That should probably be their real world IP address unless they're doing various things to make Word somehow respect the proxy settings. Which is my uh, a possibility. How much time we got now? Five minutes. Okay. If I was to open this up and look at the Word, the documents in it, I would basically get more of the same thing. So you see a OT, ODT, like open office document, XLS, and a few other formats. But you get the idea. Basically, uh, Marcus's tool is a much more professional way of doing it than what I had before. Um, but I can also view those things like a, well, I always show tour log. So let me go down to another thing that you can do to mess around with people. Um, I have a hidden service set up at this location. So this is going to be a race condition to see who can hack my site first. Right here, this is running Mutiliday. Mutiliday is deliberately vulnerable scripts. And I find it's very, very easy to write deliberately vulnerable. PHP code. Currently it's been taken over by Jeremy Druin who's a much better coder than I am. Um, but you, if the website has vulnerabilities, there's different attacks you can do to possibly de-anonymize them. And I'll show you a few of them right now. I'm just going to describe this one because of time. This one I'm doing an SQL, sorry, a command injection attack and telling it to ping an IP address. If I was that IP address, I could sit there, sniff my connection and see who's actually pinging me to figure out who they really are. Another option might be yeah, Tor is acting way, way slow in here right now. Let me see. Broken is insecure, sensitive. I'm looking for direct, insecure direct object references. I'm opening that one too. So this demo may or may not work. I have videos of this online. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm using a vulnerability where I can do command injection. I can have it trace route to me and see the IP addresses along the path and hopefully figure out who someone is. However, Tor on this network is running pathetically slow. Believe it or not, I did demo it earlier. But the idea is basically you can get command injection, you can get that remote box to contact you back. And if anybody really wants to see it, I got about three minutes, don't I? Two minutes. Oh, question, yes. Then I would get the IP address of the VPN server, assuming that all, it's not like a split VPN tunnel, I'd, probably, I'd get the IP address of the VPN server. It might get me a, a few notches closer, but yeah, it wouldn't be instantaneous. Question? Yes? Is there any advantage to trying to sort of engineer your turn network bouncing through various jurisdictions that are opposite one another? Maybe, but I haven't really looked into it. I mean, I, in theory, I guess, maybe, because I know there's some control you can do over which, uh, no, nodes you hop through. Um, yeah, it looks like my Tor connection is not doing that well. If anybody wants to see this, I have videos on my website about doing this. But essentially it's just injecting and making that remote box contact you back. You can also do it do a, via remote file include, like have it suck up a, a file from another website you control and have it deliver up the IP address that way as well. And um, I have uh, had videos in the past of that working. But unfortunately I am out of time and Tor is going very slow for me. So I thank you for your time and if you have any questions, I'm around.